Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Brian Crombie Radio Wire on Saga 960. So the holidays are over and we're all set to go back to work. And I thought it would be really interesting to check in with a gentleman that has been called the office whisperer and hybrid expert by the New York Times about what's going to happen this year in regards to where we're working. Are we going to go back to the yeah. office? Or are we going to stay at home or we're going to be hybrid? Dr. Gleeb Sapersky is our guest. And as I mentioned, he's been lauded as the office whisperer and the hybrid expert by the New York Times for helping leaders decide how to use hybrid work to improve retention and productivity while cutting costs. He serves as the CEO of the Future Proofing Consultancy Disaster Avoidance Experts, and he wrote his first book on returning to the office and leading hybrid teams after the pandemic, a bestseller called Returning to the Office and Leading Hybrid and Remote Teams. Dr. Sapersky, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for inviting me, Brian. It's a pleasure. My honor. And you're coming to us from Columbus, Ohio, I understand. That's right. It's the American heartland, not too far from Canada. Fantastic. So, um, you know, lots of people are saying, you know, hybrid's here to stay. And other people are saying, oh, no, mm -hmm. it's not. We're all going to go back to the office. And mm -hmm. then I've heard other people say, if you don't go hybrid, you're not going to get the best employees. And then other people say, but if you're not demanding, they all come back to work. You're not going to get the best uh, uh, cooperation, collaboration and teamwork. So what is it? Is hybrid here to stay or is it just a passing fad? Well, I presented to the deputy ministers, the Canadian deputy ministers about five or six months ago to their leadership team specifically about hybrid work. I was the only expert that they brought in from the only outside expert for two day retreat. Uh, and I spoke specifically about this topic. So it was a very, very hot topic for them. Very, very interesting. And since that time, I've worked with a number of ministries, go governments. So the government of Northwest Territories, Nova Scotia, Ontario, specifically on how to customize hybrid work for government workers. So we're not even talking about the private sector here, which tends to be ahead of the public sector. We're talking about the public sector. And there's no question that these three territories, these three provinces, and of course, many others that I'm talking to as well, starting to work with as well, they all intend to have hybrid work, no question. That is going to be a big focus. And that's again for public workers. So private workers, of course, are going to be in a hybrid modality, spending a bunch of time in the office. You know, Canadians are one of the few nations where people spend actually less time in the office than the United States. So Canadians are actually ahead of the United States in this one. It's really interesting. So, so you're saying that uh, public workers for sure are going to be somewhat hybrid and, and private companies even more so somewhat hybrid? Private companies, private companies, no question, are going to be more hybrid. So generally speaking, private companies tend to be ahead of public workers in all sorts of future of work areas. And hybrid work is one of these areas. But so why are you, you saying at, that if the United States uh, is going uh, away from hybrid and back to the office more? The United States is not. I'm not sure where you got that information. If you look at the past year, let's say the Castle Systems Survey. So the Castle Systems weekly data has been looking at what is the presence in the office for the top 10 cities in the U.S. starting from February 2020. And by the start of 2022, so January 2022, a year ago, it got to about 50%. And then it started, then became a little lower, a little higher, a little lower, a little higher. It ended the year in December at 51%. So that, that was a 1% increase over the course of the whole of 2023. So we're not in the United States in any major way going back to the office. I suspect once the numbers come out for this month, for January, we will see similar numbers. They'll be 51, 52%, something like Good. that. And so why do you say that, uh, I thought, I apologize, I thought you had said that Canada doesn't have as uh, much of a return to the office as the American, uh, uh, as That's America true. does. So yes, comparatively speaking, Canadians spend less time in the office than Americans do. Compared to the rest of the world, Americans spend a whole lot less time in the office than the rest of the world, but Canadi Canadians are actually spending a little bit less time in the office than Americans. And then the UK of all the major countries is the one that spends the least amount of time in the office. So that's kind of the breakdown. Then you go to Northwestern Europe, spend somewhat more time in the office than the Asia Pacific spends even more time in the office. So Canada, no question, is going to spend not that much time in the office. Hybrid is absolutely the future. 
not simply for the public sector, but absolutely for the private sector. We're no, seeing that's this interesting because uh, you know certainly what you read in the media, at least what I do, is that lots of companies mm -hmm. are mandating return to the office. The banks uh, in New York are, and things like that. So you're saying that th this might just be, you know, media reporting, but not in, not in truth. That in really, in reality, we're still in a very hybrid mentality. Well, when they're reporting return to the office, they're reporting return from remote work to hybrid work a couple of days a week in the office. They're not reporting five days a week is incredibly rare. There are a couple of companies, large companies that have recently mandated it like Boeing and a couple of large banks in New York like Goldman Sachs. But the vast majority of banks have not. The vast majority of large companies, even manufacturing companies like Boeing have not. They and Boeing and other companies are losing talented employees <laughs> as a result of doing so. So it's really? a hybrid so you're saying world. companies are losing talented employees if they mandate full-time uh, office work. And they're especially losing employees to smaller companies. So when we look at this research, we very clearly see that smaller companies and younger companies are having much more flexibility than older and more established ones. So anyone who wants to have a more flexible schedule is better off looking for younger, more recently established, flexible companies, and that's what's and that's where employees are going. Not only do they have more possibility for more rewards in these younger companies, more recently established ones, if they can get stock options, but they have a lot more flexibility. That's fascinating. And, and so, tell me, you're the expert here. Is hybrid work more productive or less productive? Yes. Well, yeah, we've had plenty of research showing that hybrid work is more productive. I'm not saying full-time remote work. I'm saying hybrid work. That's because when we look at the kind of activities that are best done in the office and best done at home, we don't have see that all sorts of activities are best done in the office or best done at home. We see that the things that are best done in the office are more collaborative tasks, things that require in-person or benefit, they don't require, they benefit from in-person collaboration, like decision-making conversations, where we can see each other clearly, we can hear each other's full tonality, we can see each other's full body language, and we can build trust. That requires more intense collaboration, more nuanced one-on-one -on -one conversations. That is better than the office. Mentoring on the job training, especially early onward, and socializing and team building. That's better than the office, but, at home, you're much better off doing one individual head down work, programming, analysis, writing, all that sort of stuff. Asynchronous communication like video conference calls and synchronous communication like video conference calls, telephone calls, and asynchronous like Microsoft Teams messages, emails, and so on. So when you can divide the work that's best done at home, you're much less distracted, you're much more productive, and then you're much more productive on your collaborative tasks when you come to the office that gets you the highest productivity. That's fascinating. And uh, is this a uh, a conclusion um, that you think everyone agrees with, or is there still a debate about what you know you saying is is true or not? That's the conclusion of the research shows. So when we look at the actual research, so for example, I can share about a study that was done. There was a study done on a major travel agency called Trip.com, which assigned half of the staff in its IT division to work on a full-time in the office schedule, Monday through Friday, nine to five, and have to work on a more flexible hybrid schedule. And it was random assignment. So staff with odd numbered birthdays had to work in the office full-time, half staff with even numbered birthdays worked on a hybrid schedule. After six months, we saw that the people who were working, the programmers who were working at home wrote 4.4, uh, some of the time, wrote 4.4% more lines of code and they had 35% better retention. So not only were they more productive, but you were able to retain these people better. So no question that that was a better modality. And there's plenty of other studies shown similar findings that when you compare hybrid to full-time in the office, then you have unquestionably higher productivity for hybrid. There's a little bit more nuance when you compare full-time remote, and I can talk about that. But when you talk about hybrid versus full-time in the office, yeah, uh, there's no question that hybrid will beat out full-time in the office when you're looking for productivity as the metrics. This is a fascinating conversation because it, it's, uh, it's in, I think, intuitively correct. I, you know, What you say makes a ton of sense, but I, I yeah. haven't seen that a lot of people are actually accepting it. You've got uh, some people that uh, are arguing, no, no, we all got to be back in the office. And other people that say, no, it's you know at home all the time. And I guess what you're saying makes a lot of sense. In my own experience, you know, mm -hmm. I get most of my... I get most of my work done 
um, at the office, but after everyone else has left because I stopped getting interrupted and I can put yeah. my head down and, and do a bunch of work. Uh, and, exactly. uh, and, and, uh, if I'm in the office, I find that I'm getting interrupted constantly, which is probably yep. important because those people need to interrupt me and they need to get mm -hmm. that, uh, uh, interaction, decision-making, uh, uh, mentoring, uh, et cetera. But it's terribly bad for putting my head down and, and writing something or doing an Excel analysis or something like that, uh, which uh, does make hard. sense to, uh, to sit down at home and in a quiet and do it. Uh, we're going to take a break for some messages and come back in just two minutes talking about remote work or office work or hybrid work and which is better. Stay with us everyone back in two minutes. Welcome back everyone to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. My guest tonight is Dr. Gleeb Sapersky. He is a uh, expert on hybrid work and that's what we're talking about uh, this evening. This is a, a pretty educated gentleman. He's got a doctor of philosophy, a PhD, in behavioral science, analysis of historical and contemporary societies. Uh, and he's got really quite a uh, impressive uh, background. Uh, he's written seven books. Uh, right now he is the CEO of Disaster Avoidance Expert and has been for the last uh, five years. Uh, and he uh, uh, has, as I mentioned, written seven books. Uh, never, go with a, never Go With Your Gut, How Pioneer Leaders Make the Best Decisions, Avoid Business Disasters, et cetera. Uh, pretty impressive background. He's been a speaker, a trainer, a facilitator. He's been a professor, a consultant, a coach, uh, a certified Vistage speaker. Um, it just goes on and on. A very impressive resume, sir. And you're now described as the expert um, in hybrid work. Uh, and you've been called uh, by the New York Times, the office whisperer and hybrid expert for helping leaders use hybrid work to improve retention. So let's ask you, what do people want? What do the employees want? When we look at the surveys of what employees want, hybrid is the most popular option that they choose. So generally speaking, of remote capable workers, people who can work full-time remotely, something like 15 to 20 to 25%, depending on the survey and the wording, want to work in the office full-time. So that is who wants to work in the office full-time. When you look at something like 25 to 30, 35, depending on again, the survey, the wording, want to work full-time remote. And that means 50 to 60% want to work in a hybrid modality, spending some time in the office, and some time at home. So that is the general breakdown of what happens. And you see that that's aligned with, generally speaking, what employers want, but you have people wanting to spend more time at home, something like most people would probably want to spend most of the work week working from home, and most employers would want to spend people to spend most of the work week in the office, which is where a lot of attention is coming from. Why? Um... Why do people want to work from home? Is it they like like me think they're going to be actually more productive because they they enjoy no interruptions, or is it because they are going to do other things, uh, take care of kids, uh, uh, you know, sleep in, uh, or um, they just want to get away from the commute? It's a multiplicity of of reasons. Indeed, people want to do their individual work at home. They feel like, and the research shows that they are more likely to be interrupted at work. They can't get a lot of their work done. They're distracted. And especially their individual head down work, like you were describing before the break, is much, much more difficult in the office. So they much prefer to do that at home. That's one reason. The second reason, of course, is the commute. That people hate the commute. That is the time of the day that they're most stressed. That is the time of the day that they are most likely to get into an accident and get killed. So, And of course, it costs money. So they do not like the commute. A for certain categories of people, which tends to be caretakers, there is definitely a desire to look after the home and do various chores in between doing the work task. But it is a sub, that is a subcategory. It is not the predominant category. Of course, it's important to think about these caretakers, working parents, people who take care of their elderly family members, those are valuable to think about. But those are generally the categories, the reasoning, and different people have a different mix of those reasons. Okay, so let's turn to employers. Why do employers want people to be at work? Is it because they think they're more productive or because they think that they're less productive and taking time off and sleeping on the job if they're at home? It's a very nuanced, complex dynamic. And here's the truth. A lot of bosses don't know how to manage people when people are remote. 
And so this is the fundamental, fundamental problem. But they've been successful for 30, 40 years in the office. You can empathize with the boss. Now, he, most likely he, sometimes she, but much more likely he, has been successful in their career. They've been working in the office all this time, 20, 30, 40 years. They know how to manage people. They're used to management by walking around. That's what they know. That's what they're comfortable with. And so it's very uncomfortable for them to learn new ways, to learn new habits, to even acknowledge to themselves that they should learn new ways and new habits. There's going to be a whole category of bosses who are just very, very reluctant to learn new ways of leading. And there's another category who accept that they should learn new ways of leading, but they are still very, don't know how to do so. So they try to lead in a hybrid modality and then it doesn't work and then they try to default to what they know. So those are the major obstacles that I observe. And that's, I was saying, sharing at the beginning of the presentation, how I worked with a number of Canadian, not simply private entities. I worked with a number of companies, but I worked with a number of government agencies, the provinces. And I see that time and again, that managers just have so much trouble learning and leading in that hybrid modality. And they're very reluctant to allow people to work in a hybrid modality because they don't know how to manage them. Okay, so answer the question then. How do you manage best in a hybrid uh, modality? How do you how do you manage when people aren't under your under your thumb and you can't see that where they are and if they're working or not? Well, that's what I wrote my book about, returning to office and leading hybrid and remote teams. So there are several ways that you need to think about things. One is, what is the performance evaluation going to look like? So we'll talk about that category. And there are a number of categories about communication, collaboration, and coordination. But let's talk about performance management, which is a crucial, crucial area. The typical performance management is management by walking around. Do I see you working? And then once a year, you have that major annual performance evaluation where you sum up all the do I see you working time and the kind of tasks you produce. That doesn't work well, of course, when someone is in a hybrid modality, coming to the office maybe two days a week and working from home three days a week because I don't see you working. So the solution to that is switching away from just doing that once major annual performance evaluation to frequent small scale performance evaluations once a week, once every two weeks, once a month, depending on the seniority of the person and their role. What you do is you tie their activities to the team's broader key performance indicators, and you choose three to five goals together with the employee for the period for one week, two week, three week, whatever it is, four weeks, when the employee has to hit those goals, three to five goals tied to the broader KPIs. And then that you meet again, so you have that meeting, and then you meet again in one or two weeks, and you see, did the employee actually achieve those goals? What kind of problems did they encounter? How can you solve those problems in a more effective way? So you give them some coaching. Then you give them a performance evaluation for that two-week period or one-week period, and then you set three to five goals for the next period. And that's how you can address their performance evaluation. You can make sure they're working. You can tie it to their key performance indicators of the team, which you need to hit. And that creates a much stronger relationship between the manager and the employee. It lets the employee always know where they stand. It addresses proximity bias, which is a serious issue. And that is a much, much more effective technique for performance evaluation than the typical management by walking around and once annual performance evaluation. Well, what you're saying makes a lot of sense. You become more performance oriented rather than just putting in the hours oriented. It's like less, uh, you know, FaceTime and more produce the results. Um, you mentioned uh, right. proximity bias. What the heck is proximity bias? Mm. So proximity bias, for those interested, I have a Harvard Business Review article on this topic. Proximity bias is our tendency to favor those who are closer to us and disfavor those or ignore or forget about those who are not close to us. There was surveys, extensive survey research showing that managers tend to forget about people who are currently working remotely. They tend to forget about promoting them. They don't assign them high the performance that they were due. I mentioned earlier in our conversation, the study that showed that in trip.com, that there was the half of the people who are working in a hybrid modality were performed better in terms of li writing lines of code. They wrote 4.4% more lines of code. But manager evaluations of their performance wasn't higher than the people who were in the office. They had this, about the same performance evaluations by managers. So managers weren't able to catch their improved performance because they weren't trained on catching their improved performance. And that is an aspect of proximity bias, where you 
don't favor, you don't tend to look for and favor and promote and evaluate accurately and appropriately people who are working at the time remotely or in a hybrid modality. So this is really interesting because what you're saying is that employees can actually be more productive and happier in a hybrid uh, scenario. Mm -hmm. And it's managers problem uh, that we've got. Yes. Managers, number one, need to learn how to uh, to live in that hybrid environment, how to manage in that hybrid environment, and how to evaluate uh, performance in that hybrid environment. So it's it's managers that have got to learn how to deal with this environment more than employees. You're absolutely right, Brian. It is about managers. Fundamentally, it's about managers. Managers need to learn how to deal with this hybrid environment. And the ones who are succeeding, that's why you're seeing the younger companies, more recently established ones, they are the ones who are hiring younger, more capable managers who are able to manage teams in a hybrid and remote environment. And those are the companies that are getting ahead and they're succeeding. Whereas managers in state old traditional companies, they're having a lot of trouble managing in a remote hybrid setting. And so they are falling behind. So if you were invited in to consult with a company and the, and the CEO said, I want everyone in five days a week, what would you tell them? I'm not the right guy. <laughs> I, wouldn't cons I would not consult for a CEO that says I want people five days a week because that's just speaking to his or her gut, overwhelmingly his in this case, of that those people who say that. It's just not going from the actual business case. What I do with a company is I look at the business case. What's the business purpose of having people in the office? What are you trying to accomplish? If you want people to collaborate together, how much time are people spending collaborating, right? You were saying earlier about how you get your best individual work done when there's no one in the office. Same thing as spending time at home, right? There's no difference, except you had to commute to the office to do that. So why do you want people in the office to do their individual work? It makes no sense. It's illogical. It's much, much better for people to do their individual work from home. Then you free up your office space. You don't need as much office space. You save an office space. You retain people better. You recruit people better. People are, when you look at, I was just a, at a staffing agency conference and I was talking to the staffing agencies about hybrid work versus remote work. And one attendee said that they advertised two jobs, same job, same role, and for the same company, just one happened to be in the office. It was a team whose manager was more flexible and one manager who wasn't. So the man, one manager who wasn't, they had all their employees in the office for five days a week. The manager who was more flexible, was a hybrid role, half time in the office. The hybrid role got something like 215 employees. The in-person role got three applicants. So that tells you about re recruitment for these types of roles. We very clearly see that people do not want to spend full time in the office doing same, the same exact thing that they would do at home. People hate that. And that is the kind of thing that I would talk about. If you care about retention at all, if you care about the morale of your people, if you care about recruiting people, if you care about, especially young people are much less likely to come to the office full time. If you care about the continuity of your company, then you should not be having people in the office full time. It just makes absolutely no sense for remote capable employees to do so. It makes no sense. To demand it's absolutely no sense and and you've said that from uh from the podium uh to speeches you've told people that publicly that uh, makes no sense it makes no sense it just doesn't make a bit any business case when you uh, care about your business when you care about your profit when you care about your employees which you know anyone who should care about the, your employees if you care a, at all about that it just doesn't make sense to do so it just completely is going to be unproductive it's going to harp you harm your morale, engagement, it's going to undermine your retention, it's going to harm your recruitment, and it's just going to be bad all around. The only good thing is that it feeds the egos of leaders who feel comfortable in that modality, who are stubborn, who are attached to traditional ways, and who are very reluctant to change, to adapt to new circumstances. And that's just not the future. We very clearly see even not only employees not going to these places, but improving technology that makes remote work better and better and easier and easier. They're standing against not simply employees and employee preferences and productivity, engagement, morale, but they're standing against technology. And, and people who stand against technology don't win in the end. Is the problem that some bosses just don't trust people that uh, are working at home? Yes, I think that that's definitely part of the problem, that they don't know how to 
manage that performance. I described how to manage their performance. And so if you're used to managing performance by walking around and seeing if people are working, and if that's the only thing you know, then you get into what's called functional fixedness. That's kind of the one of the cognitive biases, the dangerous judgment errors that happens in our minds. Sorry, what's functional it called? Fixed, functional? Functional fixedness. It's the technical name, scientific name for what popularly is known as the hammer nail syndrome. When you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So when you learn one way of leading, one way of collaborating, one way of managing people, that's what's functional for you. In a new context, that may well become dysfunctional, like in the current context, when people want to spend some time working remotely. But you don't recognize that, and you keep trying to use a hammer, the office-based way of modality, to function in this new world, which is not a fully office-based way of modality. And so they, these leaders who don't want to change their spots, they're the ones who are going to be left behind. This is a fascinating conversation. I really appreciate you uh, educating us in this. We're going to take a break for some messages and be back in uh, just two minutes with uh, Dr. Gleeb uh, Sapersky talking. I'm going to ask him about how this is going to change our workplace. Stay with us, everyone. Back in two minutes. That's good. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. I'm having a really interesting conversation, which I think is appropriate, uh, you know, as we all head back into uh, jobs after a little bit of break with Dr. Gleeb Sapersky. He is an expert on uh, on remote work, hybrid work, uh, and uh, and work in general. He's got a, a PhD in organizational behavior in, in behavioral economics. He's uh, uh, got, uh, what was it, six best-selling books, and now a seventh Seven. that he just released. Um, yes, and, right. uh, and and he's been called by the New York Times, um, the office whisperer and the hybrid expert. Uh, and he serves as the CEO of a hybrid work consultancy, disaster avoidance experts, and authored, as I mentioned, the best-selling book, Returning to the Office and Leading Hybrid and Remote Teams. Um, would this have happened if it hadn't been for the pandemic? Yes. So we already saw increasing amounts of remote work already prior to the pandemic and all the all this new technology that allowed it so we saw that around 2000 we had one percent of all work days were spent working remotely on the eve of the pandemic it was around five percent spent working remotely and so you could clearly see the trend lines and technology like video conference calling with zoom with microsoft teams google meet and so on skype allowed that Slack, of course, and Microsoft Teams allowed more of that messaging exchange. Trello, Asana Mondays allowed project management. So you already saw a lot more companies spending time working remotely some of the time and some of the time in the office. So full-time remote work or hybrid work was definitely on the rise. The pandemic just drew forward what was going to happen anyway by over a decade or more. So we, though this is just accelerating trend lines that were clearly happening already prior. So there was a big controversy, I'm not sure when, uh, maybe it was a decade or a decade and a half ago, when uh, uh, there was an author that wrote a book called The World is Flat. Tom Friedman, I think, was uh, mm -hmm. the author. Uh, and he argued that with globalization, with communications, with technology, we could work anywhere and uh, we didn't have to be in big cities. And then uh, Richard Florida, who... Uh, is um, renowned as sort of the the, the expert uh, on cities, the urbanist uh, came out with a with a counterpoint saying, no, the world is spiky, and that uh, for collaboration reasons and for agglomeration reasons and a whole bunch of other reasons, people are uh, you know group up in New York and London yeah. and Toronto and and major cities, um, and the world is spiky. Um, uh, mm -hmm. So with hybrid work or remote work, is the world flat or is it spiky? With hybrid work, it's no question spiky. So I, as I mentioned before, the best reason to come into the office is collaboration. So Richard Florida is absolutely right in terms of the benefits of collaboration. And so for the sake of collaboration, you can come into the office. But Friedman is also not fully incorrect in the sense that you can work remotely effectively. So we see that some com the young, most young companies, that the youngest companies, newest companies, a number of them are born remote and they are working full-time remote. They just take more time and effort and they are more deliberate about their systems and processes. So it is definitely more difficult 
but you can certainly set that up and the outcomes are overall in terms of cost savings, return on investment, the research shows that that's a better modality. So overall, considering the return on investments on not having office costs and being able to hire from anywhere, companies overall have the best return on capital if they're fully remote, but they don't have the highest productivity and that's a challenge. And they have some challenges with that agglomeration. If they need to work with a number of other companies and collaborate with them, that causes some problems. So. I've helped 26 companies and nonprofits and government entities figure out their transition to the future of work. 24 of them chose a hybrid first modality. So working on the hybrid modality, two of them chose a remote first modality. And those were younger companies with more individual style contributors who can work more time remotely. How is this going to change the office? If, if you're hybrid uh, and you don't therefore need people with their own specific offices five days a week, uh, what do you do? Do people still have offices? Do they have cubicles? Do they have desks? Do you have hot desks? Do you like, how, do, how does it all, or do you have like just big long tables? Like, yeah, you sometimes see Starbucks. Hmm. Overwhelmingly, the transition for companies that are actually figuring out their plans and making a decision on the long term is a transition to more collaborative spaces, less space overall. So cutting their space by 20, 30, 40%, more collaborative spaces and hot desking. They might have some offices which are schedulable. So there are a number of, I talked about digital technology that is making it easier to spend, to work remotely on a hybrid modality. You can schedule office space. If you need an office with a closed door for conversations that need to be private, you can schedule conference rooms. You can schedule desks, including near each other if you want a team to come in together and work together. So that's very clearly the future in terms of looking at the cost structure, looking at what you're actually doing in the office for collaboration. That is absolutely the future of office space. So private offices are no longer, they're going to go away. Private offices are going to go away, except in for some leaders who still prefer them and they have the power to do so. So if they wish to spend the organization's money that way, they can and they do, but most of my clients have not have chosen not to do that. But if they are a well-off organization, they can certainly and have done that. When you're when you're uh, working at these long tables or these workplaces that are mm -hmm. sort of uh, shared workplaces common, are you are you actually productive? I, I would have thought it would have been very noisy and people interrupting you constantly. Well, what you're forgetting is that this people are coming to the office for collaboration. So if you're coming to the office for collaboration, for meetings, for co-working next to each other, you're collaborating, great. You are supposed to be interrupted. That's kind of the point. So you're coordinating, you're collaborating. And if you're working on your individual stuff, you're not intending to get high-level tasks done. Maybe you're working on some stuff that's, if, you, if you're interrupted, it's not a big deal. You're not working on your really focused projects. And then when you're finished with your collaborative tasks, then you go home. Usually there's some kind of common hours, like let's say 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. when people are coming to the office and they beat the morning rush hour by coming at 10 a.m. and they beat the evening rush hour by leaving at 3 p.m. and they get all of their collaboration done that they needed during that time. So come to the office for two days a week, those hours, skip the rush hour, very convenient. You're not really spending time in the office doing your individual tasks. Some people, you sounds like you, like to do that in the office, choose to do so. And if so, they can schedule private offices in order to do so, or they can stay after hours or come before hours. Well, you know, in my own personal situation, it's interesting. If I if I come to the office between 7.30 and 9, it takes me an hour. And if I come after 9.30, I can do it in half an hour. So I save, I save half of my commute if I delay it. And I also find that some That's of my saying. most mm -hmm. productive times to return phone calls and emails is like eight to 9.30. And the reason why is because I get those emails to people or phone calls into people before they start the workday. So they're working on the priorities mm -hmm. that I've given them. Uh, and mm -hmm. uh, and so what I often will do is, uh, is, is you know, start my day uh, with a bunch of emails and phone calls um, from my home and then yep. delay my commute until after, uh, after, uh, after nine o'clock and I, I cut my commute down by a significant amount. And then what I try to do is schedule a phone call that I've got to have for my commute mm -hmm. time. And so therefore even my commute mm -hmm. time is productive as well. Yep. That's exactly what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. Start the day at 
you know, the collaborative part of your time at 10, 11, then end at three, four, you skip the commute, you work some time at home before that, you do collaboration in the office, and then you come home and you can do a little bit of work if uh, that's needed. Great, that's perfect. That's the perfect schedule. That's exactly what we should be doing. That's what we should be aiming toward in the future. And now, new technology things... is coming out that is making it easier to do that. Now, one of the things that uh, you know some people complain about is that everyone's taking Monday and Friday off um, from work. And, uh, and so therefore, there's no one downtown on Mondays and Fridays. Mm -hmm. Yes, so that's a problem for downtown, but it's not a problem for companies, right? So right now, there are a number of companies that are actually thinking about how to solve that problem by co-scheduling offices so that maybe you can share your office with another company which has its employees coming in on Monday and Friday. They're saving a lot by subleasing that space from you and coming into the office on Monday and Friday using that office and they, are, especially younger companies, are doing that. So that's a very nice strategy for companies to collaborate that way. Our transit systems are dependent on uh, people commuting every day, and uh, ridership is down dramatically on Mondays and Fridays. And our downtown, you know, shops and concourses are dependent on people coming to to you know pick up the dry cleaning every day and and have some lunch every day and stuff like that. What's going to happen to our office buildings and our our transit systems and our downtowns? if uh, everyone goes hybrid? What we need to do is really think about what's going to happen in terms of government support for these folks. They will need to accommodate and adapt to the new situation, just like the, just like the horse and buggy industry wasn't saved <laughs> and cars replaced it, the situation will be similar. It's called creative destruction. That's what capitalism is about. It kind of sounds harsh, but I think it's important for governments to do some support for folks who are going to be losers and to help them either adapt to the situation, move to the suburbs. I know a number of chain restaurants, are example, for example, are opening up in the suburbs instead of opening up downtown. We can't simply save people, well, restaurants, by forcing everyone to the office. That's kind of ludicrous. You're causing everyone to commute. You're really they're causing them to struggle. It's much better to support them somewhat with taxes, which people who are working in the hybrid modality would be happy to pay a little bit more taxes in order to not commute into the office. And the transit system, it's something that the government should be providing. And so that's the government needs to support the transit systems a little bit more and also restructure them to accommodate people's new schedules where they are not coming into the office nearly as frequently on those days. So you should reduce, obviously, the ridership on the days that they're not coming into the office. You should increase the support for suburb transit. So if people are, um, you think, going to be working hybrid uh, a lot more, uh, are yeah. or going to be working hybrid a lot more, what we're going to do is we're going to have a lot less um, demand for office space. People are going to be sharing offices, yes. sharing desks, uh, things like that. Uh, and then uh, what we're going to do is we're going to have a less need for office space. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, the office market uh, uh, developers, uh, owners of offices are going to be challenged. But then also governments are going to be challenged because of less property taxes. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot governments... of ad adaptation that has to take place here. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So governments, uh, it's important to think about, again, the winners and losers. The winners are going to be suburban governments where more money is going to be spent. The losers are going to be downtown governments. So it's important to redistribute some of the winning, some of the lo lo losing to the appropriate, and that's what the central government is for, to do some redistribution. So that's kind of one dynamic in terms of governments. Second, yeah, office buildings are going to be losers. And that's part of the, in the same way that we didn't force people to go shopping into the malls and because of the rise of e-commerce and we're not you know, trying to save the malls, why are we going to try to save office buildings? Office buildings need to be redeveloped and they need to be developed into multi-use spaces and housing. That needs to be the future to the extent that it can be. The ones that can't be redeveloped need to be demolished and housing needs to be built. We certainly have a huge problem with housing in this country and with the excellent immigration system that we have in terms of in Canada with more and more immigrants coming that is certainly some folks who need a lot of housing. So we need to build up housing for them. So office to residential conversions are something you support. 
Absolutely. And this is something that the government needs to spend more money on and give more tax breaks to developers who do so. Um, you mentioned that there's new technology uh, that's coming or yes. that's out that allows uh, or, 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 or is better for collaboration. Uh, can you give us a sense of what some of that uh, technology is? Sure. So let's talk about generative AI as an example. It's a big, big hot topic, right? Generative AI. And if we think about generative AI, there's a lot of technology that is enabling easier collaboration. Lots of folks might have seen Zoom and Microsoft Teams using meeting summaries. So where meeting summaries, where you don't have to go to a meeting, the meeting is going to be summarized and you're going to get bullet points from the meeting. That means you're going to have less meetings, less of that meeting burden overload, and you can spend more time doing your focused work and not attending meetings. That's one example. Now, that's just one out of example out of many, many examples where generative AI is making communication collaboration easier. Generative AI trained on the company's internal files can get you a lot of internal information where previously you had to talk to people in order to get that information. And talking to people, of course, is easier in the office when you can just go over to someone and ask them some questions. There's a little bit of friction when you have to do that in a remote setting. When both of you, you're working hybrid or fully remote, you have to communicate with someone, it takes more time. When you can get that information from generative AI, it's much, much easier. So that makes the core much less friction, makes coordination and information gathering easier. Another benefit is brainstorming. The generative AI is an excellent tool for brainstorming, where previously you wanted to get together in the office with people to brainstorm ideas, let's say marketing ideas, new marketing campaign, new products, whatever customer service ideas, how to write some emails, convince people. You can use generative AI for that. You can be by yourself and get some a lot of ideas. And so you can brainstorm together with generative AI and then come to your team with some finished ideas and have them be not the originators of ideas, but the evaluators of ideas. And of course, they can revise the ideas. So generative AI is enabling a lot of things that previously you needed or were most strongly benefited by being in the office to do. That's a fascinating uh, description of some of the technology that's coming. Uh, we're going to take a break for some messages and come back uh, in just two minutes with some concluding comments with Dr. Gleb Sapersky about uh, work and what's happening uh, both now and in the future. Stay with us, everyone. Back in just two minutes. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on uh, Saga 960. Well, it's a new year. Uh, holidays are over. We're all back to work. And so the issue is, are we back to work in offices? Or are we back to work um, at home? Or are we back to work in a hybrid uh, modality? And uh, our uh, our expert on uh, remote work and hybrid work, Dr. Glebe Sapersky, has been with us uh, for the last uh, hour talking about how hybrid is actually the best way. And that if uh, employers aren't willing to offer hybrid work, they're probably going to lose some of the high quality employees they want. Uh, they're not going to be able to retain the best employers, employees, and uh, that uh, people are going to be looking elsewhere. Uh, and that there's actually a benefit from a productivity standpoint in the studies that he quoted in regards to hybrid work. Uh, and it makes sense because sometimes you got to do, you know, close the door, quiet work, and it makes sense to do that at, at home. Uh, and rather than everyone, uh, you know, commuting the same rush hour, uh, you know, having staggered hours uh, makes sense. And yet at the same time, you've got to have some collaboration. So he still thinks that the world is spiky and that we're going to be living in big cities. We're just not going to be going to offices in those uh, downtowns of big cities all the time. Uh, Dr. Tuzbersky, uh, Sapersky, what other big trends uh, do you see uh, coming in the, in the workplace in the future uh, or other technologies that you think uh, are going to be, uh, uh, be useful because of this, uh, this hybrid scenario that you're uh, advocating? To talk about generative AI, I want to talk about presence. This is another big issue that companies struggle with because for collaboration, one of the big benefits is presence. Feeling that other people are present with you and you are present with other people, that builds trust, that build, you can see more of their body language, you can hear their tone of voice. So that builds connection and closeness. And we have increasing virtual reality and augmented reality that is making presence more doable whether it's uh, Apple glasses, whether it's Facebook's new glasses, whether it's various Microsoft is coming out with some of these glasses that are enabling augmented reality and virtual reality, which causes people to feel really present kind of with a hologram-like situation. So people are really 
getting ahead in that future of work scenario. It sounds futuristic, but it's really around the corner. It's probably within the next couple of years where it will be much more available, at least in the enterprise setting, these augmented reality technologies. Well, you know, that's interesting. I'm not sure about augmented reality, but just video, I think, is a huge improvement over just uh, a teleconference. I find that uh, when people are are uh, are on a, a teleconference or even on you know teams or zoom but don't have their picture showing they're not mm -hmm. as present they're not paying as sure. much attention um and uh and then you know the worst is when you start getting emails from someone that's supposed to be in your meeting and and you yeah. know but they're actually looking at their emails and sending emails yep. at the same time as they're supposed to be in the meeting talking to you and so i do think that there's uh there's a, a need for presence uh in mm -hmm. uh in our communication because otherwise why be in the meeting absolutely Okay. What about our workplaces uh, and and you know any other trends that you see? You know we we have uh, this this trend for uh, ping pong tables and uh, <laughs> and slides and fancy coffee shops. Is that a trend that's going to continue? No, I don't think that's a trend that's going to particularly continue. That's uh, something that was a trend of more luxurious economic times, and I just don't think that that's something that we're seeing that those things disappear. And that's not something that employees want. So there are, when you look at the research and the surveys, what employees really want, they they appreciate uh, free breakfast and so on. So they do appreciate free food. Uh, that is something that they want. They don't care about slides. They don't care about pool tables. They care about free coffee somewhat. But what they really care about is flexibility. They care about controlling their schedule and they feel about they care about feeling like they're trusted. And that is fundamentally what's at the heart here that employers need to trust their employees and treat their employees like adults and trust that they hire the right people and learn how to manage them effectively in this new world. So that is what's the trend that I see in the future. Those are the companies that will succeed, the ones that trust their employees and treat them like adults. Do houses need to change? Do we end up having to build offices in all of our homes if we're all spending two or three days a week at home? Oh, you haven't built a home, an office in yours yet? <laughs> yes, increasing, people are increasingly improving their homes and companies are increasingly paying for it. So that's definitely a trend where companies are paying for home technology, home furnishings to make people's offices, home offices more comfortable and more usable. Whether it's soundproofing, whether it's, of course, desks, technology, all of that sort of stuff. Companies are increasingly paying for that. Employees are getting it. And it is it is absolutely the future that a home office will be a must. Not necessarily in terms of the constructing walls and so on, but a separate dedicated space where you can work in a comfortable way. That is absolutely a must. Last question. Some of these people I've talked to have uh, almost become nomads, uh, work nomads, where they're traveling the whole world. And, uh, and working from different countries and different cities yep. and skiing one week and on a beach the next. Is that something that's gonna continue? Absolutely. So I mentioned that the youngest companies, the newest ones, especially the ones in tech, mid media, professional services, they are often fully remote. And those companies allow their employees to work from anywhere. And often people who go to them are very highly talented people who are very capable and very energetic. They have the energy to work all day and ski all, all evening or party all night or ski all weekend, whatever it might be. And of course, if they work in a different time zone, then it might be working during the time that that's the day here and skiing during the day there. So yes, it's definitely digital nomads is definitely a trend that will continue because of the companies, the younger companies and your companies that are hiring fully remote workers. Dr. Gleeb Sapersky, thank you so much for joining us tonight and educating us on uh, on how employers need to trust their employees, how uh, collaboration is something that we uh, we need and innovation. Uh, and that means that at some times we need to get together, mm -hmm. uh, but that also we need some quiet time to think and to work. and uh, And maybe that's best done um, not in an office uh, where you're interrupted, but but at home. And that uh, I think the most important thing that you said is that uh, if uh, you're demanding your uh, employers come in every day, you're probably not going to retain all the good employees, and you're not going to get all the good employees. Uh, and that uh, and that maybe the other end of the extreme is also true. If uh, you allow people to never come in, 
um, uh, then you're not going to get the collaboration and, uh, and innovation you need. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's a fascinating world that uh, we live in. And I think that the way that you described it about you know, the world is still spiky, but at the same time, uh, the world is a little bit flat. Uh, and we can uh, be almost anywhere to communicate. Uh, um, it, 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 there's an appeal to that and makes a lot of intuitive sense. And it's nice that you've got the facts to back it up. So thanks very much for joining us. We appreciate it. Thank you, Brian. And whenever you hear a complex narrative that doesn't fit into a word, into a soundbite, that makes it much more likely to be true. <laughs> that's our show for tonight, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, have a great 2024. Uh, I remind you, I'm on every Monday through Friday at 6 o'clock on 960 AM. You can stream me online at saga960am.ca. You can uh, stream anywhere, even from Columbus, Ohio. Uh, and you can get on my podcast and videocasts on my website, briancrombie.com. Good night, everybody.